For many years, the Australian continent was unknown to Europeans. Some navigators had their ships blown close to its northern shores, but beyond that, nothing was known. Early mapmakers thought it covered the entire lower portion of the globe. In the 12th century, the Portuguese called it Terra Australis Nondum Cognita, the unknown southern land. It was finally claimed for Great Britain by Captain Cook, when he landed at Botany Bay and claimed New South Wales for the British Crown in 1770. Colonisation began in 1788. The colonists found that they'd come to an animal wonder world. Many Australian animals, large and small, are marsupials. This means the female animal has a pouch. The young are born in a semi-embryonic state, blind, hairless, and with no back legs or tails. The mother gives no help at all. This baby kangaroo, two centimeters long and weighing a fraction of a gram, struggles upwards into the pouch using only its two front feet. Once in the pouch, it fastens onto a nipple and it stays there until it's old enough to leave. It grows rapidly. If it's a male, it will grow to over two meters tall and weigh up to 65 kilos. All marsupials are born in a similar way, but some don't have a pouch at all, like this rare little animal, the red-tailed Fasca gale, or Wombenga, which carries eight babies wherever it goes. They start off really tiny and grow very quickly. At four weeks, they're over two centimeters long and occupy a large area of the mother's body. She's about 10 centimeters long and the babies weigh almost as much as she does. By this time, they have their hind legs and tails and mother still has to feed them all. As there's no pouch, the babies just have to hang on tight while mother skips about with great skill in quite tall trees. Sometimes she goes down to the ground and often feeds there at night. Wombangas are carnivorous animals, feeding on beetles, cockroaches, spiders and so on. After weaning the young, she makes a nest, usually in a hole in a tree trunk, and leaves them in it. Soon they grow fur and emerge to carry on the life cycle. Males die after mating and females are also very short-lived, so one generation is almost completely replaced by the next. The biggest and best known of all the marsupials are the kangaroos. They're 
kangaroos are the most prolific, there are more kangaroos in Australia than there are people. Close to 25 million kangaroos of various kinds and only just under 16 million people, mainly living in coastal towns and cities. Like people, kangaroos don't always agree with each other. They have an occasional argument. They're grazing animals, living on plants and grasses in every type of habitat from the snow line to the desert. There are 47 species of kangaroo in Australia. The biggest one is the grey. Both the western and eastern greys keep to the cooler temperate areas along the southern coasts. This is a young Euro kangaroo, sometimes called the common wallaroo. It likes rocky, hilly country with surface water close at hand. It won't go looking for water in time of drought and many of them die of thirst. Its cousin, the red kangaroo, is more adventurous it will travel long distances to find water. Both the red and grey kangaroos are better survivors than the euro. Wallabies are really small kangaroos. These beautiful rock wallabies have a very specialised habitat. Their camouflage is very effective. Some kangaroos are very small, and this one is also very rare. It's called the Rufus Hare Wallaby, or Mala. It seldom grows taller than 35 centimetres. It can also survive without water in the hot and arid desert country of Central Australia. The graceful hopping action of the kangaroo is unique. No other animal in the world weighing over five kilograms uses hopping to move around. At slow speeds, it's a very inefficient method of movement and the kangaroo doesn't use it. Instead, it uses its forelegs like a pair of crutches, swinging the hind legs past them using the tail as an extra leg. But at speed, hopping is remarkably efficient. And after the first few hops, it doesn't need much effort, rather like using a pogo stick. The muscles store energy in elastic tissues as the animal comes down, and the energy is reused on the way up, rather like bouncing a rubber ball. Once it's bouncing, you don't need very much energy to keep it that way. It's an ideal way of traveling in a hot and arid climate, and it enables the kangaroo to travel enormous distances, up to 20 kilometers and back in a single night, to find water. Kangaroos are also very tolerant to dehydration. They can exist for up to three weeks without water and lose up to 30% of their body weight without any danger. And when they drink, they top this up again. Drinking solidly, they can put on 10 kilograms of body weight in about half an hour and can store away over 10 litres of water. Young kangaroos are called joeys. When the joey is old enough to leave the pouch, he begins grazing for himself but he also needs supplementary food from his mother. 
This is a remarkable feature of the kangaroo. Most females with mature young in the pouch have already mated again, and the resulting pregnancy is halted at about the six or eight cell stage until the young either leaves the pouch or becomes lost. When the mature joey leaves the pouch, it triggers some hormonal mechanism and the dormant embryo immediately resumes its growth. And that's not all. When a female kangaroo has a suckling young at foot and another immature joey in the pouch, she produces two different grades of milk, one for the younger and one for the older. We've only seen a few of the many species of kangaroo, but we must end with the strangest one of all. It's called Lumholz's tree kangaroo. Very rare, it lives in the rainforest of northern Queensland. It's completely nocturnal, and it lives in trees because that's where its food is found, various fruits and leaves. It has powerful forelimbs and strong curved claws. A strange member of Australia's animal wonder world. Eastern and southern parts of Australia, tall eucalypt forests support a leafy canopy high above the ground. They also support a variety of wild creatures, amongst them the koala, a furry, chunky little tree-climbing marsupial weighing in at about 12 kilos and looking like a cuddly grey teddy bear with a black nose. Climbing trees with nonchalant ease, koalas don't have the constant task of searching for food like most other animals. They live on leaves, nothing else, just the oily, pointed leaves of the gum trees, which give out the pungent scent of eucalyptus oil. Rather like eating cabbage leaves dipped in disinfectant. Eucalyptus leaves are very fibrous. They don't contain much water or protein. And their oils contain traces of phenol and cyanide, which makes them unpalatable and toxic to most other animals. Koalas don't worry about this because their digestive system is specially adapted to handle it. There's a strong bond between mother koalas and their young, which stay in the pouch for seven months. Afterwards, they stay very close to mum, who spends a great deal of time grooming and fondling her baby. When it's time to move, it's either a piggyback job or hang on underneath. The extra weight doesn't seem to affect the mother's stamina or sense of balance. And here they'll stay until it's feeding time once again. Here's a distant relative of the koala, the common wombat, found all over southeastern Australia and Tasmania. Like the koala, there's a strong bond between mother and young. Unlike the koala, wombats are grazing animals, living on grasses and shrubs. And instead of living up in trees, they inhabit underground burrows. They can cope with a wide range of temperatures, and instead of hibernating in their burrows during cold weather, they'll forage for food even in the snow. This grassland in South Australia offers a habitat for the southern hairy-nosed wombat. In the cooler months, they often feed in the daytime, leaving their burrows in the early mornings and sometimes traveling quite a long way to find their favorite grasses. For a heavily built animal, he moves around quite briskly. 
In the summer, when temperatures often rise to over 40 degrees Celsius, that's 105 degrees Fahrenheit, they spend all day in their burrows, only emerging in the cool of the evening to soak up the last rays of the sun. Some of them live in huge communal burrows. This one is probably the largest in Australia. The floor is littered with the droppings of wombats down the centuries, but recent droppings prove the cave is still occupied, each wombat having a tunnel leading to his own compartment. This one has been here for some time. Its rodent-like front teeth are very similar to those of a huge extinct relative. This remarkable skeleton, found in a salt lake north of Adelaide and is about the same size as the African rhinoceros. Scientists believe that these great grass-eating mammals became bogged in the lake during the final stages of a disastrous drought and any survivors were too weak to continue the species. Wombats are still subject to drought conditions and for many years were classed as vermin. But since they've become protected by law, both the common and the hairy nose species are steadily increasing in number. The Great Barrier Reef is a ribbon of individual coral islands and reefs extending for a thousand miles down the eastern coast of Australia. There's an amazing diversity of colour and form down here. A single reef can shelter more than 500 species of fish, more than the total number recorded in the whole of the Atlantic Ocean. jeweled underwater wonder world of Australia. On one of the small sandy islands, a green turtle makes her way up the beach. It's just after midnight and thousands of turtles are doing the same thing. Each December they come in droves, some of them from as far away as New Guinea or New Caledonia, to lay their eggs in the warm sand. Nests are sometimes so close to each other that some eggs are disturbed while new ones are being laid. Morning light reveals the intense activity of the night before as the last of the turtles heads for the sea. The first of the year's hatchlings makes a desperate dash for the water to avoid the piercing eyes of predatory birds. Other reptiles are not so gentle as the turtles. Nine out of the ten most venomous species of snake in the world live in Australia, the largest and most dangerous being the taipan, which grows to three and a half meters. It relies on its venom to kill its prey after rapidly striking and then withdrawing, confident of the end result. What follows is typical of all snakes. The jaws are dislocated to allow the prey into a mouth which appears much too small for the job. Gradually working the mouth around the meal, the seemingly impossible is accomplished. Another seemingly impossible feat is performed by the carpet python which uses its powerful muscles to climb trees. Not always successfully at first, but 
but later to defy the laws of gravity as it glides from one tree to another. Fascinating reptile, yet a frilled lizard. When threatened, it spreads a scaly frilled collar to make it appear larger and fiercer than it really is. It isn't afraid of making a vicious strike on occasions. If all else fails, it just runs away on its hind legs. It may look funny, but it gets him out of trouble. In Australia's far north, there are only two seasons, the wet and the dry. Even in the dry season, the river pools or billabongs hold enough fresh water to attract a huge range of birds, from waders such as great white egrets and spoonbills to the stately jabberoo storks and bolga cranes. Up here, the steamy waterways are a habitat for the deadliest predator on the continent. The saltwater or estuarine crocodile, biggest member of the reptile family. It grows up to 7 meters or 23 feet long. It lives mainly on fish and water birds, although larger prey are sometimes taken. Dingoes, kangaroos, and sometimes human beings. It's a cunning and dangerous hunter. A smaller and entirely Australian species is the freshwater crocodile, which is relatively harmless. Like the saltwater crocodile, it's totally encased in armour. It's a slender animal with a long, narrow snout. It may seem aggressive at times, but it's a shy animal, which usually keeps well away from contact with humans, and dives for cover when disturbed. Australia has plenty of small carnivorous mammals such as the spotted-tailed quoll or tiger cat, but there are no large ones. And the larger grazing animals, kangaroos and wallabies, have very few predators, apart from crocodiles and dingoes. Dingoes were introduced many years ago and are a canine species not indigenous to Australia. The largest native carnivorous mammal to have lived in Australia within human memory is the thylacine sometimes called the Tasmanian wolf, or tiger from the stripes on its back. This sad piece of film was taken of the last known surviving thylacine which died in a zoo in 1936. In the same year, legislation was passed to protect the species, but it was too late. Many people believe there are still groups of thylacines in unexplored country, but as yet, no sightings have been officially proved. 
In the meantime, the title of Australia's largest carnivorous mammal goes to a strange little animal called the Tasmanian Devil. It's more of a carrion eater than a carnivore, preferring to feed on carcasses rather than to kill for itself. Despite this, farmers can still obtain permits to destroy them during the lambing season. They're nocturnal animals, and although quite common, are not often seen during the day. Their eerie nocturnal howlings can be quite unnerving when heard for the first time. Mothers are very attentive to their cubs and often put up with a lot of inconvenience. This is the rugged Pilbara district in northwestern Australia with temperatures up to 46 degrees Celsius. It's the home of one of the tiniest mammals in the world, which lives in spinifex, a grass-like shrub which grows in spiny clumps, giving food and shade to wildlife in the area. An adult Pilbara Ningawi, like this, has been weighed in at two grams, seven hundredths of an ounce. They're nocturnal animals. They sleep all day in the spinifex, only coming out at night. What is remarkable is that they survive without drinking at all. They're highly specialized animals. They obtain their moisture from the food they eat, mainly grasshoppers and cockroaches. They're fierce little animals and will often attack prey bigger than themselves. Like some other small marsupials, they only live for one breeding season, so each year a new generation completely replaces the one before it. We've dealt with herbivores and carnivores, and now we come to omnivores. They'll eat anything. The bandicoot family. This is the nest of a brown bandicoot, or quenda, just a pile of leaves, no structure at all. The bandicoot sleeps here all day, and nobody would guess he was there. At dusk, he emerges to find food. Anything that's going. Grubs, roots, insects. It's an energetic search that goes on all night. Other species in the bandicoot family are the long-nosed bandicoot, found mainly along the east coast, and guns bandicoot, an attractive animal with white bars on its back, now almost entirely restricted to Tasmania. Bandicoots are biologically remarkable. They have the shortest gestation period of any mammal in the world, exactly 12 and a half days. And they're the only marsupials to have a placenta which doesn't appear until the ninth day. The umbilical cord is one and a half centimeters long. On its way to the pouch, the newborn embryo stretches this umbilical cord to six times its length. The baby fastens itself onto a nipple in the normal marsupial way, and the cord breaks about an hour afterwards. No other animal in the world is born in this way. The most splendid of the bandicoots is also the rarest, now confined to a few small communities in desert areas. The rabbit-eared bandicoot, or bilby. It's the only bandicoot to live in a burrow, which it does, presumably, to escape the heat of the desert sun. Bilbies spend the daylight hours in their burrows, and they forage for food all night, like their short-eared cousins. A favorite food is spinifex seed, which is very high in protein. Other foods are ants and insects, such as grasshoppers. 
Once common over most of Australia, the bilby is now a rare and endangered species, extremely difficult to film. The World Wildlife Fund has financed a research project to find out why its population decline occurred and to encourage methods of building it up again. to the second largest bird in the world, the flightless emu, which stands one and a half meters tall. A bird which can run at 50 kilometers an hour, but only has rudimentary wings and can't fly. Emus are omnivorous. Favorite foods are grass, leaves, shrubs, fruit, and insects. They have powerful feet with three strong toes. Normal male-female roles are reversed with emus. After the female has laid her clutch of eggs, and sometimes even before she's finished, the male bird starts to incubate them. He sits on the eggs for 56 days without eating or drinking. During the early stages, the female may stay close by. As hatching approaches, he may get off the nest and check the eggs, stretching cramped muscles. This nest has 17 eggs, greeny blue in color, about 13 and a half centimeters long and weighing almost a kilo apiece. Periodically he turns them over, ensuring that his body warmth is evenly distributed. There are many birds in the bush all around him. One of the most common species, but a very beautiful one, is the pink and grey galah, a gregarious, noisy, seed-eating cockatoo, which usually occurs in large flocks. The time eventually comes when the chick starts to chip through the egg. A tough job because the shells are very strong. Once free from the egg, the chick has to wait until the other eggs hatch before getting attention from its parent. Sometimes the attention is less than welcome. The male parent looks after his chicks with great care and is fiercely protective. He stays with them for a year and a half, only leaving them long after they're fully grown. From a bird that can't fly to a mammal that can, or almost can. Another marsupial, this is the yellow-bellied glider, largest of the gliding possums. Gliders have a web of skin between their limbs, which can be extended to form a sort of rectangular sail. Using this, they can glide for up to 100 meters, a very convenient way of traveling from one tree to another.
Australia's animal wonder world. Now for a walking fish. The fascinating mud skippers in the semi-tropical mangrove mud flats. When the tide goes out, the mud skippers emerge. These are the largest species, about 36 centimeters long. Using moisture left in their gills, they can breathe while out of the water. And strong pelvic fins enable them to walk about on the slippery mud quite rapidly. With their eyes on the end of stalks, they have almost all-round vision which allows them to move quickly to their food supply, mainly small crustaceans, such as shrimps and prawns, and other small marine animals. A confrontation. However, the crab is a little too large to be a mud skipper meal. There are still more fascinating animals in this Australian wonder world. One, a living thermometer, two with extraordinary diets, and two mammals which lay eggs. Now, an interesting group of birds, the mound builders. The jungle fowl build large mounds of vegetable matter in the tropical rainforests of North and Eastern Australia. The mounds generate heat as the vegetation rots, and the birds tunnel into them and lay their eggs. In due course, the eggs hatch and the young birds emerge to make their own living. The brush turkey is another mound-building bird which also lives in rainforests on the east coast. His mound consists almost entirely of leaves. At first, in the steamy jungle heat, the mound builds up to a high temperature. As it cools to about 33 degrees Celsius, the female lays her eggs. Without doubt, the most sophisticated of all mound builders is the mallee fowl, a turkey-sized bird which occurs along the south and lower west coasts. This amazing bird actually controls the temperature of the nest mound. Eggs are laid every few days up to a maximum of 33. After each egg is laid, the male bird acts as a living thermometer and earth-moving machine. Using its beak and tongue, and assessing quite complicated factors such as humidity, sunshine and air temperature, it maintains the eggs at a constant temperature of 33 degrees Celsius to a tolerance of plus or minus 2 degrees. It does this by physically adding soil and leaves to the mound, or by removing them. In the process, he shifts about a cubic meter of material each day, and in 11 months of unremitting toil, he can move up to 300 tons of material a year. times he's helped by the female, which lays up to her own weight in eggs every year. The young are capable of looking after themselves as soon as they hatched. Remarkable birds. It's not clear whether some animals live in particular habitats because of their dietary needs or whether the diet is determined by the environment. Either way, the Western Australian honey possum is unique. 
Living in a habitat where banksia and dryandra trees blossom all the year round, the honey possum's diet consists entirely of pollen and nectar. It isn't a possum at all, really, but it's the only member of its scientific family, and that makes it scientifically very important. It's a tiny animal. Males weigh up to 8 grams, and females up to 12. While feeding on the flowers, it cross-pollinates them, most unusual for a mammal. He's licking pollen off the flower here with his highly specialized tongue. It's worth stopping for a moment to examine his mouth in more detail. This picture, enlarged through an electron microscope, shows bony crescent-shaped ridges on the roof of the mouth. These are toothed combs. Now, here's the tip of the tongue, which has a complex system of papillae, rather like a little mop. Further back, and extending almost to the extreme rear of the tongue, smaller papillae, resembling short brush bristles, collect pollen as the animal licks the flower stamens. As the tongue retracts into the mouth, the brushes scrape along the serrated comb teeth on the hard palate, and the pollen is removed. When the tip of the tongue is fully retracted, the mop is squeezed, as it were, and nectar is reclaimed. It's a complex structure in a tiny area and stamps the honey possum as unique in the world. In this white gum forest of Western Australia lives a rare and beautiful animal which feeds on nothing but termites. Here, in a hollow log, is a family of numbats. Early in the morning, the mother emerges from the log and checks for possible dangers. She has four young, each baby about six inches long with a striped back like her own and a long bushy tail. The youngsters still depend on their mother for basic nourishment. She has to go off now to find food to replenish her milk supply. It will take her all day, and she will eat up to 120 grams or 45,000 termites before returning home to her babies. In the meantime, they stay close to the log in case of danger from predators. They must be able to get back in there quickly. As they get older, they become more confident, moving further away from the nesting log. Although, if anything, they're even more alert to possible danger from predators. Bird wings are a dreaded sound. They start to forage for food themselves, clawing up underground termite passages and foraging in dead logs. Once near extinction, Numbats are now building up their numbers again, and hopefully may spread further afield. A termite eater of a very different kind is the Australian spiny anteater, or echidna. Not to be confused with the porcupine, which is a rodent, the echidna lives entirely on ants and termites. Because of this, it's often found in open forest areas, where fallen wood is attacked by termites. It has no teeth, and it catches its food by flicking out its long, sticky tongue. Ants, or termites, stick to it, are drawn into its beak-like mouth, and are then swallowed whole. Echidnas are mainly at home on land, but they will swim when they have to, which puts them a little closer to their only known relative, the platypus, which we shall see shortly. Platypus and echidna are the only two mammals in the world to lay eggs. 
This is the only known footage in the world of a baby echidna emerging from the egg. It feeds on milk exuded from the mother's mammary glands onto its underfur. By pressing on the glands, drops of milk are squeezed out and are sucked off the fur. Echidnas have no milk nipples. The baby grows rapidly and stays in a typically marsupial pouch. As the spines begin to grow, the mother discourages its offspring from staying in the pouch and it's placed in a nesting burrow until mature. This is the final animal in Australia's animal wonder world. A strange animal indeed. When it was introduced to the British Museum, it was pronounced a scientific hoax. No one could believe it was genuine. But genuine it is. The Australian platypus, Ornithorhynchus anatinus. Literally, duck-like animal with bird-like snout. The only relative of the echidna. Probably the most unusual animal in the world. Bird-like bill, webbed feet, heavy fur, and a tail not unlike a beaver's rudder. The bill looks bird-like, but it's not rigid like a bird's beak. It's soft and rubbery, and very sensitive, with the nostrils close to the tip, permitting the platypus to breathe while partially submerged. It has sharp eyesight and acute hearing. The ears are just an opening set in deep grooves just behind the eyes. When the platypus dives, it closes off its eyes and ears so that when underwater, it's deaf and blind. But the platypus has a secret weapon, the bill. A large part of its brain receives information from the bill exclusively. It's an extremely sophisticated sensory instrument and enables the platypus to hunt successfully without eyes or ears. Even when surface feeding, the bill is always on the move, probing, touching, searching, passing on countless messages to the cerebral cortex of the brain. When submerged, the platypus tends to feed on the bottom. Bearing in mind that it can't see or hear, the speed and accuracy of its hunting shows clearly just how effective the bill is in passing on messages to the brain. When young, it lives in a nursery burrow. But the adult platypus has its own living burrow, usually just above water level in the riverbank. It takes a sharp eye to see it emerging. When hunting, it often proceeds upstream for quite long distances. Whenever it's away from the water, its one aim seems to be to get back there as soon as possible to resume its secretive, mysterious existence. Perhaps the most unusual of all the strange and exotic animals in Australia's animal wonder world.